Marcelo in to hunt it now. Surely one last chance. One last bite at the cherry here in Amsterdam. Ronaldo through to hunt it. Oh! What an ending here in Amsterdam. If that's not poetic justice, I don't know what is. The new zone knocked out Ryan on the Xbox. And this time, Boras knocked out. It's Italy's finest in Prince of Bay. What is going on? Welcome back to a brand new Foot Champions podcast. I think it's podcast number four we are on now for the FIFA 19 season. As always, thank you very much for the support over the last few weeks. Whether you're watching on YouTube, uh, hopefully now on iTunes, we should be on there as well, or via our podcast website. We really do appreciate your support as always. And of course, if you do want to get involved uh, in the conversation when you're listening to this podcast, hashtag Foot Champions Podcast is the hashtag you want to get involved in. Um, we have got a special guest of us as well. As you know, it is Thanksgiving, the, the time we are calling this. So unfortunately, no Mr. Kojo FIFA Colin Johnson. We have got someone else. We'll introduce him in a second. However... You could say the main man, the guy that I'm lucky enough to work with um, all the time. Richard Buckley, welcome back. Another Foot Champions podcast. It's safe to say it's getting a bit chillier. It is getting very chilly. Uh, if I were back in Barnsley, I'd say it's getting bitter cold outside. Um, but we're not. We're in Manchester and uh, got a nice little bit of heating to keep me going through the winter months. Um, I'm feeling fresh. I'm feeling healthy, which is a, a rarity on the Foot Champs podcast. But... With the absence of Kojo or FIFA, we've, we've brought in the big guns. We've brought in one of the biggest esports managers, one of the biggest esports organisations in the world right now. That's Mr. George Hughes. Hello, hello. What an introduction, Richards. I uh, couldn't have said it better myself, personally, my friends. I like to think, uh, with Kojo not being here, you've obviously upgraded to the best manager in the UK region. You know what I mean? Well, it's a pleasure to have you on, George. Of course, we don't know George Hughes, um, now the FIFA Esports Manager at North Esports, uh, of course, a Danish organisation over there. And uh, they've got Aga and Marcuso. um, The dream team, uh, the On the the books at the moment. Of course, Aga was uh, the first signing there. And then Marcuso recently from Manchester City to... Uh, the North. Uh, those guys are involved in the E Super League as well. I'm sure we'll talk about all of that. But first of all, George, uh, a congratulations from us and probably everyone that's listening as well. How did that move come about? And I know you've been, you could say, job searching for a while. It must have been a perfect move for you. Do you know what? It was uh, It's just one of them things where you can't really say all the pieces came into place at the right time and it worked out very much in my favor. Um, I guess for the people listening at home who maybe don't know my background and don't know uh, how I ended up in this job, uh, last year for the FIFA 18 season, I worked at Hashtag United uh, with Aga, Ivan, Ryan, Harry and Dreamer back back then. Um, and I spent the whole year, that was my first introduction to the FIFA pro circuit. Um, and I just really, really took to it. I, all the people I met, everyone in the scene, I just felt right at home. Um, so come the end of the season, everything was drawing to a close. Uh, me and Hashtag felt like it was the right time for us to part ways, uh, which left me searching for a job. Uh, and I knew that uh, to become a FIFA manager, to work in uh, pro esports, uh, FIFA esports, it was an absolute possibility, thankfully, because Colin Kojo has been doing it for so many years. So when you have an example like that, it's, it's, uh, it's good to be able to, what I did, I should say, is that I went to all the biggest teams in the esports scene. I submitted my CV, sent off loads of little emails, making sure that they knew I was available in case any team wanted to get into FIFA. And luckily enough, North wanted to get into FIFA. They wanted to buy Aga as he came out of his, uh, as he came into free agency with Hashtag. Um, and they wanted a manager to help the team along. So I fit right into that spot. And uh, it's been going great ever since. Do you feel as though... Aga moving to not off almost. Do you think he put a, a good word in for you? Um... Yeah, Aga definitely put a good word in for me. And I think you can look at that in both two ways. You can say, oh, he's, he's got me the job. But I spent the whole of my last year building relationships with different players, different team owners, different managers within the scene. And I knew that one day it would be a real possibility that I'd have to ask someone for a favour, ask someone to put in a word for me and and tell them that I was the guy to do this. And luckily, Aga's a good friend of mine anyway. We've always got along. We've, we've got a great working and personal relationship. Um, 
So the way it worked was it's actually quite funny. So I originally emailed North before Agar had even uh, spoken to them, I believe. So they were aware that I was an option as a FIFA manager way before Aga was even on their radar. Um, and by the time I had signed, uh, Aga was already part of the team, already part of the setup there. And that meant I could slot in and, and, and sort of help his progression and help, help the team along. And, and of course, it must be said as well, you know, that th there is a lack of, uh, of FIFA esports managers at the moment where FIFA is such a new esports deal to this day and it's growing. You know, you look at the e Premier League next year, I know it's only coming in for like, you know, one event at the moment or a weekend at, at the end. You know, going forward, you look at all the other leagues as well, you know, in the French League, in the, uh, the Dutch League. All the leagues are involved in competitive FIFA. At the moment, the situation for a lot of these clubs, they've got like a marketing manager that's working on the esports side of things as well. Down the line, at some point, they're probably going to have to to, to to go across and maybe pull in um, someone that can do uh, like a job of a FIFA esports manager if it continues to get as big as it is. And, um, you know, as I said, congratulations once again. And, um, you know, a word on Marcuso as well. How did that one come about? Just... Yeah, I was so happy to get Marcuse on the team. Uh, it's almost one of them decisions that's so obvious, you know what I mean? Like, uh, to anyone in the scene, they know that Aga and Marcuse are great friends. Uh, they've been training partners for a long time now, um, constantly trying to improve each other's games. Uh, if you saw FIWC last year, or sorry, FEWC last year, um, Aga was standing behind Marcuso while he was finishing his games. Marcuso was standing behind Dago while he was finishing on the stage. But they always, always wanted the best for each other, despite what team they were on. Um, and it came to my attention that Marcus was looking for to leave Man City. And we just thought, there's, there's no better place for one of the best talents, not only in Denmark, but in, in Europe, I'm comfortable in saying. But to have, again, a Danish talent, someone who's local to Copenhagen, to play for FC Copenhagen, to play for North, um, I think it's a dream for him. Uh, and it's obviously a dream situation for us to have that duo on our team. Do you also think as well, because they are training partners, um, you put a little bit more pressure on each other? Like if you're, for example, Aguirre's pretty much qualified for everything so far. Um, Marcuso not being as successful. Do you think like the both, neither of them want to be in each other's shadow, you'd say. So the both want to, it's that competitive rivalry. You always want to be performing as good as your sp uh, sparring partner. And in this case, it is your teammate. Do you think that's something as well? Yeah, definitely. I think I think the key thing with that is balance, you know, because um, you don't want to create a dynamic where the two players hate each other and, and want to constantly push the other person down and be, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. The, the, the great thing about Aga and Marcuso is they both see each other as equals and they respect each other, they have huge amounts of respect for each other. So that means that dynamic can work and they understand that they have a job to do at the end of the day. It's not a hobby anymore. It's their full-time profession to play this game. Um, so any assistance, any help, any pressure, any sort of extra extra little thing that we, we can add to that dynamic to, to make the player perform or make the player um, play more confidently even really, really does help. And you can't, you can't underestimate that. So talking about your example to say that, to, I think um, what's really interesting is that I don't think Marcus has, has felt a huge amount of pressure seeing Aga qualify for these events. I think the pressure he's put on is on himself where he, he sees that um, he should be competing at a level that he 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 believes is higher. Um, so again, I think it's great to have that that example in Aga sitting next to you playing, and you can see even just simple things like gameplay tips and formation and and stuff like that, giving each other little tidbits on that game they just played, especially for qualifiers. Oh, if you played that guy round one, I've just matched him. What was he playing like? What was his game style like? What formation did he use? Like th those key bits of information um, really, really help uh, the whole process just move along really, really smooth. So it's, it's been it's been a great, great uh, experience so far. And whilst we're talking about um, obviously North Esports, obviously linking in with uh, FC Copenhagen, 
Um, the E Super League is a thing now. If you don't know what the E Super League is, it is uh, the Danish uh, football league. It's gone into you could say the virtual uh, ways of that a number of leagues have. As you know, FIFA Esports continues to get bigger and bigger. I know you've been a fan of it. Me and Richard have watched a, a few of um, the weeks that have gone by. They play on Mondays and Tuesday nights. If you didn't know, and you probably would have seen because of those interesting celebrations from FIFA Houston um, <laughs> and his team uh, against uh, Mobasha and Hassan. Um, what have you made of the league so far? I know you're a big fan. It. yeah i've 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 genuinely thought it's brilliant as uh, for someone so watching last year and watching the, the the circuit and how it played out um i think the the void e super league of fills and all the other domestic leagues on that matter um it feels a really interesting space because it, it's one of these things where every week they know what matchups they're going to have. They know who's playing. There's so much level, so many more levels of preparation compared to, a, say, a Champions Cup where everything has to work on the fly. It has to work, be really flexible. Um, so to have that level of production, to have that level of professionalism added to the Superliga. And honestly, it's just a great watch. Now, I don't speak a word of Danish. Uh quite ironic uh, considering I'm employed by the biggest football club in Denmark but um, the whole sh show is in Danish so for me it's been a totally visual experience it's been about watching the promos they've been doing for the players watching all the graphics they're putting on screen um, and yeah I've been super super impressed and I think what can't uh, is also worth mentioning is that this is a big big part of this is DreamHack's involvement in eSuperliga. So DreamHack were the tournament organiser um, given to eSuperliga. So it's a partnership between the Superliga, the Football League, um, D-Play, which is a TV network, if I'm not mistaken, over in, in Denmark, and DreamHack. And so all these three people have, have come together and they've created a really, really high production, high action, exciting FIFA league for us to watch. And uh, my boys might also be top of the table, but we won't mention that, you know, that's a, that's a small detail. Yeah, I think just from a, a spectator point of view, it's fantastic to see um, so many like different um leagues take the different spin on it so the Superliga very uh, produced um, very almost a casual can watch it uh, if you do definitely. speak Danish and you understand exactly what's happening you, you know the players uh, exactly. like a TV series where something like the uh, Australian e uh, Australian A League when we were watching that last season it was almost as though like it was more of a casual vibe you had players commentating you had uh, that sort of it was more like a family vibe, and I like the different sort of elements that we're all playing the same game, but different organisers, different TOs take a different spin on it. You've got the EA events, which feel nothing like anything else because of the grandeur and the scale of them. Yeah, I think that's one thing in FIFA that's really interesting, really, really, really sort of unique, is, is you can do so much with the format of FIFA. Uh, as a, a manager and as someone who's, who's working within esports now, we generally say that we like to keep it, maybe best of two, best of three, but the standard foot ultimate team, one game is one game of, of, of FIFA. Um, but it's what you do with that, which is really unique. So e, e Super League, I don't know what the word to describe it is. 2v2 is, I guess, the format, but it's a best of two across the two players. Um, and then within that, by having that dynamic, we have this really interesting thing where we flip a coin at the beginning of games to decide who the, what the matchup is going to be and then the other other team gets to decide if they go first or second on home and away goals so even stuff like that that's that's where fifa can be really unique in the format of the games and the, and the way that these tournament organizers and productions um choose to display that and choose to show fifa yeah, for sure. And, you know, you have to mention your likes of Gfinity. They did like the kind of same vibe on the Elite Series last year. I know it's a 2v2 this year and, of course, not part of the Global Series, but they've been doing some great stuff and they will be involved with the uh, the E Premier League um, throughout the year. Uh, also, the E Club World Cup, that was an interesting format last year in, in definitely, Paris. Definitely, definitely. That was the E Club World Cup sort of gave us a taste of these um, team-based competitions and how, how, how that can be introduced to FIFA. And I personally think it's, it's a really nice addition to the, the circuit. Uh, personally, I, I think that FIFA should stay 1v1. It's a 1v1 game. And that's, that's just where the sort of 
direction I am coming from. I totally understand there's arguments for 3v3, 11v11, pro clubs, blah, blah, blah. Won't go into that right now. But um, if we're just talking about 2v2s and 1v1s, um, to have a competition where my players can go to the, the Champions Cup, really knuckle down, really be super competitive and be super uh, prepared and all this stuff for their, their, their one game. They, they're the ones who play it. They're the ones who control their future. And then to change that dynamic and then the next week, perhaps playing a 2v2 um, format, you have to think about new stuff. You have to think about who's going to play first. You have to think about maybe if you want a stronger attacking player to play versus a stronger, a weaker defending player. And that's just a conversation you just never have in 1v1. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really welcome addition to the scene, in my opinion. That's good to know. And of course, um, you know, it's the good thing about having different guests on the podcast. We can talk about different avenues of FIFA esports. I'm lucky to have George on, and I'm sure throughout the uh, the year when Colin can't be here, or maybe me and Richard or one of us can't be here, that we will um, get someone else in to cover um, us. But we've got so much to talk about, as always. We talk about what's going on in the, in the world of competitive FIFA, as you know, like the qualifiers, um, obviously the West Ham Cup, the first esports cup they run. It's great to see a, a Premier League team get involved Um you know, they've been involved for a long time, West Ham, Richard, and it was kind of a, a stage of, you know, Man City have run their tournament, Wolves have only just uh, got involved. Um, West Ham have been involved for a long time. They were the first Premier League club to be involved. And at that stage, we were like, you know, it's good to have a player, but it's it's around that, the, the accounts, you know, the content, etc. like that. They came out, £25,000 prize pool they run, and it was uh, Dami um, who won that. We'll, we'll come and speak to him in a minute. But Richard, it's good to see West Ham, you could say, really starting to get involved. Yeah, obviously we got the opportunity to go to the event quite early, Brandon, on the Sunday, and we got to chat to a lot of the people at West Ham, and they're super switched on. It's not like the casual, uh, they're very casual about this, they're switched on, they know what they want, um, they know how to run an event, uh, they know what they want from their team coming in the future in the esports scene, and I can see big things coming from West Ham. They've currently got Jambu, or Jambo, however you want to pronounce it, on their roster currently, and potentially could be adding to that in the future. Who knows if something does come up for them, but the, the facilities that they've got there at the Olympic London Stadium, um, it's quite remarkable. Like, the the event that took place, it was in one of the boxes in the, uh, I think it was called the, the Royal Box or something like that, um, but they've got so much capability to be able to use that stadium. Yeah, exactly what you're saying. I think it's, 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 that's exactly where West Ham and the football clubs play a big part is they have so much opportunity to, um, to give us access to these events, access to their facilities. And they're obviously world-class facilities, aren't they? Yeah, in- incredible. And um, you have to shout out, you know, this is us just shouting out a sponsor for the for the sake of it, you know, Bassett and Gold, who, who's, you know, who out them, this tournament wouldn't have, uh, uh, have ever happened. So you have to give credit to sponsors that are coming into football clubs now and thinking about the future and the ones that are obviously supporting esports right now. A huge shout out to them. But the tournament was uh, West Ham beat West Ham. Um, and believe it or not, in the final, it was Ranners from Roma um, up against Dami uh, from Roma. It was a, a really contested final. Um, the, the surprising thing was it was the typical away console um, so-called vibe. I know it's not an ultimate team. I know it's on a on West Ham, West Ham head-to-head as such. Dami went and won his away leg um, and then just went and cruised on through the final. <laughs> so credit to, uh, to, to Ranners still. We beat Shory in the Xbox final and still... Walked away with some fantastic prize money. But as I was saying, Dami was the winner. And uh, he actually gave me a few minutes of his time to catch up with him and speak about what it was like winning that West Ham uh, Esports Cup. So I'm lucky to be joined by AS Roma and Fanatics Dami, uh, or goes by the name of Dami Hulk, his gamer tag in the past, a Polish FIFA player um, who made the FIFA E World Cup final last year as well, and uh, recently just won his first ever LAN event. Dami, welcome to the Foot Champions podcast. How are you doing? Uh, hi, thank you for having me. I'm I'm doing great. Uh, as you said, I just won an event a few days ago, so I'm still pretty excited after that. Yeah, feeling good overall. Well, thank you very much, as said, for coming on the podcast and giving up your time uh, during this crazy, kind of busy qualifying um, time. Um, you know, first and foremost, you mentioned it there, your first ever LAN event, um, obviously £10,000. You were in the final against Ranners, which was a bit of a tough one. When you qualified, you played against Zimmer in the qualifications. Um, 
of course we were lucky enough to be there to commentate on it but how was the event for you and I know obviously they had to move from foot to head to head um everyone adjusted really well but you know it was what what went well for you was just playing good FIFA on the day or yeah like I was really really worried before the tournament when I when I knew that we were going to change the mode to to the West Ham 80 uh, 85 overall so after that like I wasn't really confident I didn't know what to expect from this tournament but game by game I started feeling pretty pretty well I would say so yeah I just play really really good FIFA and I was really patient as well like the thing is for me when I'm playing on events I'm like more focused on what I'm doing I don't know why I think it should be on different it should be worked differently you know but I feel like when I'm playing on events, I'm I'm playing just much better FIFA, and that's how I won. Of course, moving on, uh, you know, for the for the whole year in general, and maybe a little bit of a chat about your journey so far. Obviously, last year you were kind of like a, a standout player at Nordavind, um, around the GFN and T Elite Series point, and you were making events there. And you know, you were playing all the Foot Champions Cups in FIFA 18. Went all the way to the final. When did Roma approach you, and was Roma always a, a great move for you? Uh, yeah, I think, like, for me, I was always supporting Fnatic, so that's why I was, like, pretty happy when, when Colin asked me if I want to join them. But yeah, I think it started just after Gfinity Elite Series, to be honest. Like, I played really, really good in Season 3 in Gfinity, and after that, many, many teams or, or managers starting to see me as a, as a good player, so, yeah, it, it went pretty fast from that point, and I wasn't really thinking too much. I just wanted to join join Fnatic as soon as Colin contacted me. And of course, you know, we, we spoke to you before on a podcast, I believe. Yeah, it was actually a podcast last year. Um, you know, one of your big things you said is that you want to be known on an international level. You know, you're, you're really well known in Poland. You've got a fantastic support over there that you're very grateful for, I know. Um, would you say, you, since we last spoke to you, would you say you're starting to be known a bit more internationally or...? Yeah, sure. Uh, people were starting to recognize me, even like the top top players. Like I was on the FEWC, so it's a great achievement for me for now. But still, like I don't want to stop on that. You know, I want even more. And yeah, that's that's what I'm aiming for. And I just want to I just want to keep winning because that's how you get the recognition, right? And of course, you have got that um, that Roma kind of FIFA house at the moment. How's that been? Because you you know you're living with the, you're living with your manager, you're living with um, Enzo, obviously like your coach, and you're obviously living with all your teammates. Has that been like a good step? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, it is. Like it's not only about like FIFA and how we are playing the game right now, but overall as a teammates, like we are we are working and living pretty well here. Like we know each other are so good right now so it helps a lot as well when you go to events like when we support each other every time so yeah it really comes in handy to be honest and i'm really grateful for roma like we all are really grateful for roma to to making this happen and of course my last question for you right now um obviously unluckily you haven't made any of the events as of yet you've been really close on qualifying i've seen that you've been Obviously, grind that Div Rivals maybe a few months ago. Um, obviously, you've been getting to the knockouts for the uh, those qualifiers. Obviously, the LQU won at the weekend. You couldn't continue because, obviously, you went and won that West Ham Cup. But for you this year, is it just to get back to that final again? Is that, like, your main motivation? Yes, it is. Like, it looks kind of hard at this point, but we still have a lot of events to play and to qualify, so I'm not that worried yet. But yeah, I really need to start qualifying for these events and getting the highest placements as well to, to get the points. Because now qualification is different, right, from, from the last year. So yeah, I need to I need to start qualifying. Well, all the best, mate, for uh, for FIFA 19 in the Global Series. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure, although you haven't made any of these big events yet, you, you have just won your first ever LAN event and you've done some great things. And so has Ranners, Zimmer, uh, obviously Alexander as well, or Alec. You know, you've done some great things for the Roma, uh, obviously the AS Roma fanatic brand. Um, I know, obviously, Colin, who is on the podcast right now, I'm recording this, um, will be over the moon. But no, Dami, thank you for your time as always and uh, good luck for the rest of the season. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, great interview there, as always, Brandon, uh, hearing for the West Ham champion himself, uh, Dami FIFA, on his success and uh, what the season holds for him. 
at Roma Fanatic. But we, we had a qualifier over the weekend and some of the guys at that West Ham tournament were actually playing in this qualifier. And no surprise, you've got the exact same similar faces popping up. Your man uh, from North, George, uh, Aggie, The Stranger, Moabamiang, Tex, um, Ajax, Lev. They've, they've had great seasons so far. Looking down the list of the uh, the 32 players qualified, is there any names that are standing out to you? For me, I think the two names that obviously stand out uh, on the PlayStation side is Aga, who this last weekend made it five out of five events qualified for. A huge achievement uh, to, the, to still be a 100% record for qualification at this point in the year. Um, but also the man who is keeping up with him and holding us to account, making sure that we're trying our hardest every single week is Mo Bamiang. But also the other man to have made five out of five events. Um, so right now, these two have to be considered, I think, the hottest players, at least online for PlayStation. Um, coming onto LAN is obviously a whole different dynamic. Um, but I think that it's, a, it's, it's great for us, at least, to have someone like Mo, who, who, who is still pushing that boundary and still um, achieving the highest. So we don't slack off, you know. And then swapping over to the Xbox side, um, you've got to talk about Donovan Hunt, Mr. F2 Tex. He is, uh, he's a, again, another level at this game. So to, I'm really, really personally quite excited to watch him play uh, come the Champions Cup in Bucharest coming up. Um, but for him, if I'm not mistaken, that was four out of four events qualified for Tex. Correct, yeah. So, uh, again, just another smashing record from him. Right? Um, and the only person to do it, on, I believe, on the Xbox side. So, again, let's hope that he can back it up on LAN. And uh, it's good to see as well. Obviously, if you didn't know, there's LQEs and that there is uh, the Foot Champions Cup. The Foot Champions Cup is 32 each console, 64 together. The LQEs are 16 people each side um, at this moment in, in time. Um, some names I'm seeing in there, Richard. Rocky. Yeah. Hello. He, he's, he's popped up. And also, it needs to be said, New York City Chris has qualified for the events now. Oh, yeah. Chris, I've been watching that on Twitter. Chris has been uh, got a great little run of results coming on now. Yeah, just silently going about his business. Uh, you've got Webb as well, who's Nazri, uh, 210017. He's always a threat coming into tournaments. A um, couple of the American boys as well on the Xbox, Kid Mamito, Goal Machine. Uh, I should say North American, uh, Goal Machine coming from Canada. Um, so it's looking like a very, very good tournament. Um, if you're English, it's not the best turnout, or British, it's not the best turnout for your boys. Um, two players representing you in Gorilla and Tex. Surprise, surprise. But um, apart from that, a pretty, pretty stacked tournament, I'd have to say. Yeah, for sure. And uh, one question we could we could speak to you, George, about is, you know, we spoke about this a little bit. There was this kind of last year, there's not enough tournaments, there's not enough qualifiers. <laughs> and now we're in a stage where people are going the other side now. There's too much, like, you know, we're not robots as such, but... You've got to say, it's just, there's so much to do. And, and you know, as much as players are going to say, and of course, this is common sense here, I completely understand this, that you want to play in every tournament, you want to play in every cup, I completely understand that because you don't want to miss out on prize money, pro points, all these opportunities. But EA's, I guess their aim is, was to say, right, if you want to play and try and prioritise the Foot Champions Cups over the LQEs, and then you've got the the leagues, etc. How is how have your players kind of kind of dealt with it? That's probably the biggest issue we've struggled with uh, coming into this season, trying to make sure the schedule's all set up, trying to make sure the, the players don't suffer from burnout, from playing way too much FIFA. Um, I think Agar actually put up a tweet the other day saying that uh, he got an email from EA saying, enjoy the break over the next couple of weeks. But obviously in his situation, there is no break. He does FIFA every single weekend. Um Personally, coming from the sort of management side of view, it's it's a difficult situation because coming in, you always want more events. You always want events to be bigger. You want events to have more, be more competitive, uh, offer more to the player. And you can, can't criticize 
anything that EA's done on that front this year. We have been offered many, many great events with new places to go, new tournament organizers working with us. So on that front, it's, it's been a really positive change. I think the thing we're getting used to in the scene right now is, is just that balance. People need to get people need to realize that it's okay to skip qualifications if you have stuff going on in your personal life. Um, and I think the change is now that we see a few players who perhaps expected to qualify for every event last year and maybe did qualify for every event last year because it was totally doable. But this year, it's a whole different beast. It's a, it's a, a really different struggle to make to be present at every event this year. And I think a lot of players just need to get used to that aspect and their own uh, expectations of themselves. Uh, the way we've been dealing is it, it ju it's just taking it week by week. You know, you can't you can't do too much at one time. And with the Superliga, our schedule is even more packed. Um, but it's definitely a position of privilege. You know, we, we, we don't really want to be the people who are complaining about having too much FIFA to play. I was actually chatting to uh, a FIFA player of the Xbox. So I'll keep his name uh, anonymous. Um, and he was saying that the qualifiers... He's picking and choosing what qualifiers he wants to attempt to, to try and qualify for. Um, he says if you try and qualify for every single thing, it's stress. It's very, very stressful that amounts up on you because say you play in every single qualifier that's been up so far and you don't qualify for one event, you then start to almost disregard your own FIFA ability. Am I even good enough to do this? So you, the idea that EA is doing this is because you're supposed to be able to pick and choose what events you actually want to go for pretty much with it with the way that the pro points works are from our understanding you can win one of the majors and that realistically could give you enough points to get all the way to the playoffs it would definitely get to playoffs that's 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 the thing if people actually did the maths and worked out how much the events can actually offer to you i think people's attitudes would would change completely um but right now i just don't think a lot of the players just don't have that level of support where they can are fortunate enough to be able to pick and choose and actually work out the whole year in advance if that makes sense um one of the things you just said there as far as uh picking and choosing and the expectation to qualify and stuff like that i think we, uh, my own team personally is, is a really interesting example of that because Marcuso, bless him, has got to the knockout stages in almost every single qualifier, but is still yet to make an event. And that's when the doubt sets in, the, the questioning your own abilities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I guess that's where the role where me and the rest of the team at North really can help is just making sure that he realizes that it's not the end of the world. Like we are not even close to halfway through the season right now. So to... Um, to, to to say that it's all doom and gloom, that the season's over if you haven't made an event yet, is just wrong. If you make one event, place well, and get to playoffs, your ticket to FEWC is absolutely right on track. Yeah, I have to say I agree with that. You know, we are still so um, you could say early into the season as such that if you get that foot champs verification status back in, I think it's the 31st of October was the latest you could apply, but then you can, of course, you can get it for any time throughout the year. If you turn up, say, you know, the last foot champions cup next April, you know, or next March and, and, and get that win, obviously 1,500 points, I believe for winning that whole um, event, you know, you, you're kind of already in that top 64 on, on either side that you need to try and be in for those playoffs. Um, and also, um, linking back to that, you know, someone like Joxan, 850 points on the board. I've already made this joke a number of times. If he goes and wins the Foot Champions Cup or an LQE, he can just go on holiday for a few months and it'll be, uh, it, it'll, it'll be pretty much home and dry for the playoffs. Yeah, it's definitely a great position to be in, Brandon. And um, I think coming into this year, we, we were thinking that to win an event, it's probably going to lock you up to at least playoffs. You know, you've got to think that the way the points are being spread right now, it's... it's uh possibly like to say that the top 64 are all going to have points within the 200s 300s that's just not going to happen you know i think when it comes to those 64 spots 63 60 second all those really bottom level spots there's going to be like 10 points in it 20 points in it and that's when stuff like weekend league could even come into play you know so it's the format this year has presented us with a real new challenge. I'm personally loving it. I really enjoy this sort of mental maths of trying to work out uh, 
predicting how well we're going to do. Um, and I think, again, it's something we were talking about earlier, Brandon. This is where the position of a FIFA manager is so useful because it means that my players just don't have to worry about any of that stuff. I tell them what events we're playing. I tell them what we're going to compete in this week. And they say, yep. And they play the FIFA and get the wins. And that's their job, you know. So, uh, yeah, good old Joxan's really put himself in the best position possible. And of course... You know, speaking about uh, an American FIFA player in Joxan, another player that, that did qualify for the LQE and I believe qualified for Foot Champs Cup 2 uh, taking place in December uh, is Alan Avi. I believe I've uh, pronounced his name right. Plays for FC Dallas. And before I do jump into an interview uh, that I recorded a few days ago, let's talk about the EMLS for a second, gents, because it's come back and it's come back with three events. It's come back with like a big final and then two events beforehand. Uh, I believe an extra two or three clubs added in there as well, which is is massive for, you know, the America's FIFA scene, which is booming. Yeah, it's really exciting, the EMLS this year. All the new clubs. Uh, so I think it's FC Cincinnati, DC United and Atlanta United are the new additions. Um, FC Cincinnati already making a big move in picking up uh, the ex-PSG player, Fiddle. Um, and also, I, th- I just think more events is only a good thing when it comes to the MLS. It was one of the most popular leagues last year, um, as far as viewership's concerned. I think it's got some great characters, some old school guys, some new talents. It's the perfect recipe for a really exciting uh, FIFA tournament. And as you said, obviously PSG Fiddle once was PSG Fiddle. FC Cincinnati. I'm going to be. I'm going to love trying to comment out on that throughout the year. Um, a difficult one to pronounce. Eh? Yeah. Um, uh, obviously he signed there. Congratulations to him. And the way it's going to work is this year. Last year it was just a. Um, what's what's the event called? Pax East. Pax East. That was where it happened. Pax East. It did happen. Like the big finals. I believe that could potentially be used still. Um, however. There'll be one event hosted um, with LA Galaxy in January, one event hosted um, with FC Dallas, um, and then I believe there'll be a big final taking place. And it'll be for points again in today. This is one of the, you could say, one of the prime, the primary leagues um, that are worth 800 points, I believe, 850 um, for winning one of them, which is uh, is really good. And again, you know, another avenue of getting to uh, the playoffs, which everyone wants to get to. And you go from the playoffs to the FIFA E World Cup Grand Final. And as I did say, um, I did catch up with FC Dallas's Alan Avi, obviously qualified for two events recently. I caught up with him to speak about why FIFA 19 is going so well for him and the recent announcement of the EMLS. So I'm now lucky enough to be joined by FC Dallas's FIFA eSporter or FIFA player, um, Alan Avi. Alan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for giving up your time. No problem. Anytime, you And, uh, you know, I might as well kick it off with, you know, I spoke about in the podcast. Um, you've recently just qualified for that LQE in January. And obviously, you know, you could played competitively last year. I saw you at the playoffs as well in Amsterdam. You got yourself there. How good is it to make that first event of the year? Oh, yeah. Well, if I'm extremely excited to, you know, be able to qualify to that um, in FIFA 19, it's pretty difficult to qualify to events. I'm not going to lie. Um, so to be able to finish in the top two out of all of the North American players, you know, the best players of the world. Um, it's amazing. And I just can't wait to, you know, go over there to wherever the qualifiers are. I don't think the date is announced yet, um, but I'm so excited, man. I'm so excited. Of course, congratulations on that. And um, how have you found FIFA 19 so far? And how have you found, you know, the new competitive structure as such? Because there's all these qualifiers now. There's so many tournaments. You know, there's there's loads. There's loads of opportunities out there. Exactly. Um, I'm so excited, you know, that there's more opportunities to qualify. Uh, but at the same time, there's so... I've been seeing on Twitter that there's so many pros that are upset with the, you know, current format of qualifying. It's very difficult, like I said, um, it's Swiss format, so you're playing against the best of the best, always playing someone with the uh, you know, same record as you, and there's no room for error, especially in the knockout round. So um, to be able to qualify, once again, is something special, and you know, I'm excited to see what FIFA 19 has in store. Uh, hopefully we can qualify to more events and you know, go from there. And uh, as I mentioned as well, you know, just before jumping into this interview, the the recent announcement of the EMLS, if anyone doesn't know, as I mentioned, uh, Alan's currently at FC Dallas, got himself a year's contract, um, obviously, at the EMLS last year, which I believe was a great experience. You see in the announcement this year, there's going to be three events in total, obviously two events beforehand, 
um, leading up to the big uh, MLS final as such. What's that been like? That news has been, when it came out, everyone was loving it. And I, I agree as well. As someone that lives in, 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 in England, in Europe, like, you know, I love to see you guys out there doing good things. Oh, yeah, dude. It's, it's so amazing, especially for esports and, you know, the EMLS. So we are going to have, you know, more events, like you said. The first series is going to be in January, I believe, uh, in Los Angeles. And then the second series is going to be in my, you know, uh, hometown, FC Dallas, where FC Dallas is located. It's going to be in Dallas. And basically, those first two series are going to be basically, you know, like uh, they're going to determine the seeding for the EMLS Cup. And the location for the EMLS Cup is, you know, to be announced. But I'm so excited, yo. This EMLS Cup is going to be great. The EMLS never fails. The production is always nice. And, you know, to kick things off. Uh, in the competitive atmosphere, you know, the North American League, it's going to be amazing. The EMLS Cup, you don't want to miss it out. Has it, has it been announced? Will it be at PAX again? or? Um, That's the thing. We do not know yet. I cannot say anything, but uh, PAX is definitely in the, in the lookout right now. But there are also other locations that the league is currently trying to, you know, investigate. And we'll see. We'll see where it ends up. It's good as well, because one thing that I really noticed as well, you know, I think I was in Paris doing like the ESWC at the time when that uh, EMLS was happening. Like one thing that FIFA, you know, as an esports struggles with is that spectator value, the live spectator, the atmosphere. And I must say, you know, as a player there, it was rocking. It was rocking last year. It really was. Um, if you're talking, you're talking about the EMLS Cup, right? Yes. 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 That was amazing. The, you know, the atmosphere was great. There was people watching on Twitch, YouTube but also in person and it was literally packed so every time we would score people were you know hitting those two balloons together going <laughs> crazy standing up so it was an amazing atmosphere you know i want to see that same atmosphere in every single fifa event that would be amazing uh, that it needs to be obviously something that needs to be looked at hopefully we can build up that atmosphere for you guys who are like the the superstars it's all about um obviously the fifa players um uh, you know the last question is you know aspirations for the year you've made that first event just to uh, keep on making events is that is that the plan oh yes of course um, i'm gonna try to you know qualify to as many events as i can uh represent fc dallas as well you know i have to do good in the emls cup try to bring it home back to dallas um, you know, I'm also doing YouTube, twitching, so uh, hopefully I can grow those channels. It's been going very well so far, thankfully, um, but, you know, just keep improving in those areas. And, of course, I will put all of Alan's links down below, um, obviously, underneath this podcast and on uh, the social media channels of the Foot Champs pod. A massive thank you, Alan, once again for coming on the podcast. Good luck in that January LQE, and hopefully you can, uh, you can make FC Dallas proud once again. Really do appreciate it, uh, man. Um, thank you so much for having me, and I'll see you soon. And stop recording whenever you would like. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, great interview there with Alan Avi. Uh, all the best of luck for him for the rest of uh, the FIFA 19 season. But uh, it's that time of the week again for Richard Buckley's big question. It usually goes to Kojo, but since Kojo's not here, George, you're going to have to step in. Uh, to each um, shoes. I have absolutely no idea what's happening right now, but I'm ready, Richards. I'm so, prepared. Since you've moved into more of a management role, uh, you've overseen uh, the move uh, from Mark Uzo, um into your um, organisation at North Esports. Do you feel as though the movement from club to club it came into my mind when we were talking about fiddle moving from psg to cincinnati do you feel as though there needs to be more structure to that do you feel as though it's a little bit too like the wild west like people coming in offering sums of money for people to leave do you think we need like maybe a transfer window potentially for players to move um say september and october that's where people can move out of contracts etc uh to new clubs or is it fine the way it is at the minute I don't know. I think it's a really interesting topic, or one that should be discussed. Um, without a doubt, there are some really sort of poisonous, if that's the right word to use, uh, recruitment tactics being used within our scene. But uh, I think what's something that's important to make clear is that this isn't unique to FIFA. This is a problem that exists throughout esports. Um, and the problem comes from, a, it's generally very weak contracts so the player doesn't understand the contract they've signed the organization has somehow cut corners with the contract and is not offering the full terms etc 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 if you're an organization and you're doing your due diligence and you're doing all your work properly there shouldn't be a way 
that your player can leave your team without the other organization coming to you, making it clear, dealing with transfer wages, if that's a thing, dealing with buyout fees, if that's a thing. Um, that all comes down to the original contract signed. Now, where the sort of gray area comes in is obviously with free agency. So when players know they're going to be out of a contract soon, when players know they're going to be leaving a club soon, um, that's normally when they'll shop themselves about to teams. That's normally where they'll start reaching out to managers and organizations. And that's where it can get a bit dodgy with players, maybe with, sorry, with teams coming maybe a couple of months before and saying, oh, if you leave this team, come, you, come the end of your contract, we'll pay you this much. When there's just no evidence to that, there's nothing to support that. There's no legal measures in place to make sure that you're getting a good deal. Um, so, yeah, I think in general, it's about respect. Uh, I know amongst my peers and the teams I work amongst, it's uh, it's a question of treat others how you'd want to be treated. So with Marcuso, it was a question of making sure that Man City sort of knew as much as they needed to know about the transfer and knew the terms that we were going to get him under, et cetera, et cetera. Just making, the, making sure that they didn't feel like they were being uh, left outside of the deal. So yeah, it's just a matter of respect, in my opinion. Uh, there shouldn't have to be any formal terms in place if you are dealing it the right way. If it comes to the point where EA have to put some measures in place, where we can only deal in certain windows, etc., etc., I actually think that would be a real shame for the eSport because uh, a lot of the excitement comes from transfers and, and team movements and the introduction of new teams, the introduction of new, new players to the scene. Uh, and for, for me as a manager, uh, I think if you're doing it the right way, you should have no problems when people approach you, you know? And it's safe to say as well that in like the kind of last, you know, 18 months or maybe even the last 12 months, we've seen some like amazing like transfers happen, some amazing announcement videos. You know, you think back to PSG Rockies video, which was just different level. Um, so yeah, ov definitely. overall, are you saying no transfer window in the future or...? I'm personally no transfer window. I think we always have to remember that FIFA is an eSport. We're not playing football. We're not under the FA. We don't have any of the guidelines and regulations that the FA are putting onto us. If we look at other eSports like League of Legends, like, like CSGO, um, what often happens is that the tournament organizers will set dates for rosters, will set dates for teams that have to be set. Us being a 1v1 eSport, we don't have that problem. Um, so, yeah, you know what? The more you talk about it, Brandon, the, uh, the, the, the bigger the box becomes. There's, there's lots and lots of really sensitive issues with this one. Um, but my preference is no transfer window. Just be kind, be respectful. Make sure you're speaking to your managers. Make sure you're speaking to the other team's managers. And if you do all that and you're polite and you haven't been an idiot to your team, then I don't think you should be having any problems. Obviously, money is a whole different ball game. But if you're dealing with just respect and just respect between two orgs, I don't think we need a transfer window. Thank you very much for that, George. It's always uh, very insightful for me. I've got a lot of questions that usually come around. I'm a big uh, esports watcher across all esports, whether it's FIFA, Call of Duty, um, Fortnite, CS. I, I enjoy all esports. So I enjoy the, the ecosystems as well of different esports. So um, I often get questions where FIFA's um, in um among those other esports and it's always good to hear from somebody i know you are a big uh watcher and believer in all esports so to hear your opinions on it is is very interesting for me but i think that just about uh wraps up the podcast brandon it does indeed obviously we've covered uh, a number of points and we've brought out a, a lot of good information as well from uh, mr george Hughes that we've had on um from north esports the fifa manager over there obviously managing um aga and uh, Marcuso and we can add a lot of questions to him as well and, and, and speak about just different angles that you won't always get um, maybe from different experiences that Collins already had compared to George 
And of course, we wish George all the best um, for the FIFA 19 season with uh, his team of North. And thank you for coming on, uh, George. Have you enjoyed it? Yeah, guys, I must say, thank you for having me. You know, I've been a long time listener. So to get the call up and be asked to be on the show, has been a, it's been really, really nice. And, and for me to be able to share just a small part of what my life is like now I've signed for North and the type of stuff I have to deal with every day. Um, I think it's great. And, and to come off what Richard said is that, yeah, we all love esports in this space. And that's the big thing that unites us. Um, and we're so lucky to have these more developed esports that we can look towards, that you guys can look towards as casters, I can look towards as manager, my players can look towards and have something that we can really aspire to and a real target of we can be this big if it takes us that far. And that's what we're all working for at the end of the day, boys. We all just want a little piece of the pie. Um, so yeah, thanks Richard, thanks Brandon. Hopefully you'll get me back on here soon uh, if Kojo doesn't turn up again. Um, and yeah, uh, if anyone wants to follow me, my Twitter handle is at George Hughes. And that's where I keep up to date with all my goings on. I was about to say, we'll put your links down below. Anyway, ah, right? brilliant. Because we're, well. cause, cause we're that nice. Um, but again, massive thank you to George for coming on. Um, massive thank you uh, to Mr. Richard Buckley, as always and the co-host over at the Foot Champions Pod. And of course, if you have been listening on YouTube or on uh, on on iTunes, please subscribe over there. Please share it with a friend. Let us know on Twitter, you know, a pro that you maybe want to have on um, in the next podcast. And also, there's another qualifier this weekend, Foot Champions Cup uh, January. That'll be Foot Champions Cup number three. Uh, obviously the qualifiers this weekend 24th 25th um, of November or if you're playing just weekendly casually we wish you all the best um, on that as well thank you very much for listening as always I've been Brandon Smith and uh, yeah we'll catch you on the next Foot Champions podcast enjoy your weekend and thank you very much for listening until next time bye bye